Okay. Well, uh, welcome everyone. We're glad that you're here. My name is Charles Allen. I am with uh, Parametrics. We've been hired by the city to work on this project. And we're glad you're here today. Originally, our plan was to have a nice public meeting where we can gather in a central place and in close proximity to one another and uh, share ideas and germs too. But recent events have changed that. So now we are distant and remote, but we're excited that we can at least do this online and share this presentation with you. Um, we want to have an interactive presentation and given the online format, our plan is to uh, go as follows. We'll, we'll share information, we'll have opportunities for questions, and you'll be able to submit those questions in writing via the chat function, which I will showcase in just, just a minute or uh, here when I, I uh, share my screen. So I will go ahead and do that now. Share my screen here. Okay. Okay, that looks good. So again, uh, my name is Charles Allen. I'm a transportation engineer with Parametrics, and I'm presenting today the results of our analysis for the Country Vista Drive corridor. Um, it's part of an overall study to look at short-term and long-term conditions for the city and help to identify projects that are needed to aid the transportation system. Um, and uh, we are, I took a particular focus, we were asked by the city to make a particular focus on the Country Vista Drive corridor, identify the uh, short-term needs for that corridor to help achieve the vision that, uh, that uh, meet the goals of the city. So a little bit of uh, housekeeping for you. There are some controls at the bottom of your screen that will help you during this presentation. The ones on the left, you have the, a mute button and a stop video button so you can uh, reveal or, or hide your video camera. The meet button we're going to be controlling so that we don't have a lot of background noise and chatter during the meeting. So when everybody joins, they'll all be on mute. And again, our, our forum for participation will be via the chat feature, which is uh, shown here on the, on the right. There is the uh, chat button, which you can click. And when you click it, it will bring up a window where you can submit questions for a presentation. So you type a question down in the bottom, and when you press the enter key on your computer, then it will submit the, the question to the chat. And throughout the presentation, we'll have some question breaks where we stop or we'll review the questions in the chat and we'll address them. So feel free to type a question anytime. And when we get to those question breaks, we'll, we'll go ahead and take a look at those and address them. Now, another thing that you can do is to uh, go to the participants button, which is another one on the bottom of the screen put out there. When you click that, it brings up a list of the participants. And here you can go ahead and raise your hand if, if, you, uh, if you need to. And, and so we'll try and keep an eye out for that if those raise their hands, um, uh, maybe have a, a concern or, or if you have a city council member who'd like to make a comment, if you raise your hand, we'll look for that and uh, we will um, unmute you so that you can uh, uh, chime in. So now uh, an outline to our discussion today, again, our focus is on the Country Vista Corridor and we're going to first talk about the context of the corridor. And then we'll get into the existing conditions and then talk about the, the future development along the corridor, you know, what's coming, future plans, future developments, and then finally, we'll get into the recommendations for the corridor. As I mentioned before, we'll have these question breaks throughout the presentation as we go along. So the study area encompasses the Country Vista Corridor from the Apple Way flyover on the west to Liberty Lake Road on the east. Um, it's about, about a mile and a half long corridor. And that is our, our focus of our discussion today. Um, first, of all, first of all, it's helpful to know what is the vision for this corridor? And that will help us defi um, define what are the elements that help us achieve that vision. So I have here the zoning map 
for the city. And we see that along this corridor, it's largely what we call the M2 zone, which is a community center mixed use district. And then we have a little bit of M3 on the east side and then a little bit of C2, which is a freeway commercial district on the west. And uh, you know, what those mean, I've pulled some little bit of information out of the zoning code to describe what these zones mean. Again, again M2 is the big one. And it's a, a mixture of land uses to encourage walking as an alternate to driving, provide more employment to housing options. And it's said to be a connection to neighborhoods and other employment areas. It's also a, a transit oriented development is encouraged here to reduce reliance on automobile and parking needs. Some of the elements that apply to the M3 zone uh, include it being you know, a mixed use business district or, or the heart of the community. And it follows similar principles as the M2 zone regarding walking and, and transit oriented development. Finally, a little piece of the C2 um, area is a little bit more uh, commercial and light manufacturing oriented. And though, even though it is, you know, um, a little more, a little more automobile oriented, it's, it's still meant to prevent strip commercial development along arterial streets. So this is a, a zoning that provides you know, business services close to major employment centers. So we have all these three zones and there's some similar themes here that they, they all contribute towards a walkable, uh, comfortable environment that also uh, supports transit. The comprehensive plan is, is much in line with the, the zoning in that there's a, a community uh, center mixed use area identified in the, the comp plan and also the central business district and also some of the freeway commercial. So we, there's some similarities um, between these in terms of how they all work together to define what this corridor um, can be and uh, how we want to get there. The, the city trails plan, or they, rather I should say the, the 2015 Parks, Recreation, Open Space and Trails plan shows if there's existing bike lanes on the corridor and the need for future park and greenway. In other words, it's identified as an aesthetic corridor or a boulevard, if you will. So that, that brings us to our first question break. I'll go ahead and take a look at the, the chat window. Um, so far, I'm not seeing, um, seeing any questions at this time. I'll also kind of scan the participants window to see if there's any activity there. Um, looks like there isn't at this point. So we'll continue on with the presentation. All fairly straightforward. This is an important corridor for the city in terms of you know, land uses and, and becoming a, a center or a, a real place for the city. And so, we want to make sure that any plans or recommendations we have with that are in line with, with the vision. So onto existing conditions. Uh, this image shows the comprehensive traffic counts data collection that we conducted to help with this study. These counts were collected in November 2019, and now you don't, don't expect everyone to um, digest all of this, but it's, it's more so to show that um, we collected a lot of traffic data citywide, including the country district corridor, to help us understand what kind of existing traffic conditions we have. And, and the reason for the comprehensive nature of this data collection is because um, this is going to also support that comprehensive short-term and long-term analysis for the whole city that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, where we're going to be looking at uh, conditions and identify potential improvements or projects to, uh, to consider for the short term and long term for the city. Um, a couple things to note that uh, what we call ADT, which is, stands for average daily traffic, on the Country Vista Corridor, the, the ADT ranges from around 11,000 to 13,000 vehicles per day, That's the total number of vehicles per day on the corridor. And then this, the smaller numbers next to that, these are the, the traffic counts during the peak hour along the corridor. Now, a little bit more focus on the existing conditions on the corridor itself. 
the corridor has the same cross section, meaning the same number of lanes and same features. There's two travel lanes in each direction. There's the center turn lane through the entire length, and there are the the park strips and sidewalk. So it uh, totals about 70, 70 feet in terms of the pavement width. Again, I mentioned the ADT or the average daily traffic volumes, you know, 11,500, about 13,500, depending which end of the corridor you're on and how, how much development there is on that end of the corridor. The speed limit transitions from 45 miles per hour to 35 miles an hour around the, the, the curve where Henry Road comes in. And uh, most intersecting, well, all, all intersecting streets are stop controlled. And so it's free flow on the Country Vista Corridor. And there's an existing crosswalk with a pedestrian refuge island um, on the eastern end by the, uh, the Home Depot. So also, uh, as mentioned before, there are the, the bike lanes that run along the entirety of the corridor on both sides of the road. And there's also sidewalks, even through the vacant parcels, there's a continuous uh, sidewalk. And then there are street trees, uh, some nice landscaping present for about half the corridor on the eastern end that is adjacent to, to the development. And, and I'll mention that it's within the city code to continue the landscaping adjacent to the sidewalk as, as the area develops. So now that our question turns toward, that's what we have now, what's coming? And that will lead into how can we help identify the recommendations that best support uh, the vision as well as help us plan for what's coming on the corridor. Um, so first of all, there's the new high school being constructed on the west end of the corridor. And that's going to uh, be accompanied by a traffic signal on Country Vista Drive feeding into the high school. Additionally, there's some, some multifamily residential approved adjacent uh, to the high school. We, to get a good understanding of the type of development that, that's expected and can develop along the corridor, we, we met closely with uh, city staff to talk about what they're seeing in terms of you know, development that's planned is, and is underway versus development that is uh, entitled um, and, and zoned for to get an idea of what are, how much growth and what kind of growth could we expect in the short term so we know um, what we need to plan for. So, so first of all, you know, we expect there to be continued development of the Legacy Ridge neighborhood as well as the Legacy Ridge West neighborhood. And then the vacant parcels along the corridor are um, approved to be built as, as commercial land uses. So um, we uh, anticipated that, that they would uh, develop with commercial developments. And, and I'll point out that you know, these, these are land uses that, uh, you know, that are expected to develop at some point, some of in the short term, some of in the long term, but these, these are all, you know, in, entitled and, um, you know, approved type of use. Now, we don't know exactly what's going in in every case. Um, so we met with the city to, to develop some estimates about the type of commercial that we might see in this area so we can understand the type of traffic demand that might occur on the roadway and uh, what type of facilities would be needed to support these land uses. Likewise, there's the, the new uh, bridge over I-90, I the Kramer Bridge, which will be coming in in the short term, which will, will provide additional connectivity for the community and another route for people to travel as they go towards their destinations. And then, there's a new bus route plan, or rather a realignment of an existing bus route that the, the transit district is planning with a, with a launch date in 2021. This will put, divert this bus route from Mission Avenue to run along Country Vista Drive and, and serve the transit center. And this would run all the way to the Spokane Valley Transit Center to the west and then link up to the, uh, you know, the, the park and ride lot within, within the city. So, you know, what does all this short-term planned and expected development mean? We went through an exercise to, to calculate what we call trip generation, which is the number of vehicle trips that can be expected for individual land uses based on their size and based on the type of commercial or residential development that they bring. 
And so this is summary graphic gives a picture of these this short term forecast for the corridor and how much traffic could be added to the country Vista corridor. So again, this is based on those land uses that we discussed closely with city staff um, that, that could develop, including Legacy Ridge, Legacy Ridge West, the high school, the, the multifamily unit apartments, other commercial, commercial development on the corridor, and um, you know what, what type of impact that they would have on, on the roadway. So um, these are these are generic estimates using uh, trip generation rates that are compiled from from national studies based on various types of land uses. So it's a substantial amount of traffic that uh, that could be added to the roadway in the short term, especially thinking about how much traffic is on the roadway now. Now, one thing to keep in mind: these are trips both in and out of these land uses and heading, you know, both east and west. Some of them heading to the north on the new Kramer Bridge, some heading you know, south on, on Henry Road. So to some degree, this traffic gets in the road, but then it can disperse to different land uses. So that's a kind of a preview of what we have on the corridor now and what we can expect to see. So we're, we're here at our second question break and I'm gonna take a look at the chat window, see if there's any Questions submitted at this time or the hands raised. For now, it looks like we don't have um, any questions submitted yet, but again, feel free to type them in anytime. And when we get to these question breaks, we'll take a look and see what's, what's been asked and how we can uh, answer those questions. Okay. So uh, the, the next topic as we, as we get into uh, the recommendations for the corridor, we analyzed the major intersections on the corridor to determine how well they would perform, both for existing conditions and with this short-term growth. And the main mechanism for analyzing an overall intersection performance in terms of the vehicular experience is a concept called intersection level service or LOS. And this is a parameter that grades intersection performance on an A to F scale. So a little bit like school and with A being good and F being worse and it's determined according to the average delay that vehicles experience. So this table on the left communicates how you meet those level service uh, thresholds, uh, how much average delay um, you'd experience. So for a signalized intersection, for example, if the average delay per vehicle at the signal is 15 seconds, then it falls within that B range. If the average delay per vehicle ever exceeded 80 seconds, then uh, we fall into the F range. Now, typically this is evaluated for the peak hour or the busiest hour of the day. So it's, it's a representation of how well the signal is doing during that peak demand. Uh, the, the illustration on the left um, is a visual depiction of, of how level service might correlate with what you might experience when you're at an intersection and how busy you might feel. Um, unlike school, if you come home with a report card full of Ds, you might get scolded and, and lectured. In terms of transportation planning, our target essentially is level service D or better. And, you know, E and F represent the failure or the breakdown range where, where the signal um, flow starts to break down and you have to wait multiple green lights to get through. Um, D is busy, but stable and then C, B, and A tend to be a much more free-flowing intersection. And so our target is, is D or better because it provides a good balance point of good performance without um, overbuilding. Again, if you remember, we're looking at the traffic performance for the peak time of day. If, if we build something to be level service A for the busiest time of day, then it's gonna, and it's level service A is already pretty empty, then we're gonna have um, extremely large roads that are very empty for, for other hours of the day. So um, 
that's an introduction to what level service is to help set the stage for how we can analyze the, the intersections along the corridor. So um, in particular, we took, a, we took a look and focused on two intersections. One is the Legacy Ridge Drive intersection. The other is the, you know, the Henry slash Kramer intersection. And today, level service is around the, the C range. And then with the added growth from all that short-term de development, they both move into a level service F. Um, so, um, you know, what that means is we start to have um, a difficult time for drivers making the turn on and off the side streets on the country Mr. Uh, drive. Uh, they start to experience longer delays and waits. And, and so, um, you know, the intent at this point is to start to look towards mitigations that might help that condition and what are our options. So we took a look at a, a couple of different options. One is the one is a roundabout, and then the other is a signal. And in order to understand the right type of roundabout to put in, in this condition, we, we turn towards several sources. There's some planning level information from a publication uh, by the NCHRP, which is a uh, National Cooperative Highway Research Project. And it's a, it published a roundabout guide that helps you get a sense at a, at a planning level what size of roundabout you would need because that dictates how much capacity it, is, it has and how well it will flow. So this, um, these guidelines state that you take a look at the volume of vehicles entering the roundabout on a given leg, and you add it to the number of vehicles circulating within the roundabout at that point. You take the sum of those two numbers, and then you compare it to these thresholds, and these thresholds tell you, hey, you could be fine with a one lane roundabout, or you might need to think about two lanes on your roundabout approach, or you get to a point where, yeah, you're pretty much gonna need a, a two lane entry for that leg of the roundabout. So the table on the bottom of this slide shows those thresholds. If this sum of the circulating and entering traffic volume is less than a thousand, then it's likely the one lane will be sufficient. Uh, if it starts to get above that and get towards 1300, then you might need two lanes and more detailed analysis will help flush that out. And then finally, when it's above 1300, then yeah, you're pretty much uh, in that two lane entry zone where that's the, the size of roundabout you would need. So how does this apply to our current condition? I, these next couple of graphics um, add together those entering and circulating volumes at both the Henry Kramer Road as well as the Legacy Ridge uh, Drive intersection. And so we can see here, this is the Henry Road uh, with the Kramer Bridge added in uh, PM peak hour volumes. And we can see that we definitely exceed 1,000. We creep towards even uh, above 1,300 in a couple locations. So it indicates that we likely need those two-lane approaches on each leg. Turning towards the Legacy Ridge uh, Drive intersection, here the volumes are a little bit lower, but in, in the PM peak, we're still seeing volumes near 1300 on the east leg. And then if we were to take a look at AM, these volumes would likely flip. They'd be a little bit of a mirror of each other. We'd probably see pretty high volumes over on the west leg as well. So both of these, round, uh, both of these intersections are suggesting that a, a two-lane roundabout configuration is going to be the best fit to accommodate the traffic volumes that we're going to see. So depicted here are screenshots of a couple examples of what two-lane roundabouts look like. There's uh, you know, two entry lanes on the major road. So imagine that it's this country vista drive running east-west and there's two lanes through the roundabout. And then those minor streets often can be fine with the one-lane approach. Um, but this is, you know, a, a depiction of what these types of roundabouts tend to look like. So this is what analysis suggests the type of roundabout would be needed for these intersections on Country Mr. Drive. Now, in terms of a, out evaluating a signal, they're a little more straightforward. You don't have to change the geometry uh, as much when you put in a signals with a roundabout. So um, generally, the same type of lane configuration that exists today will work if you just put a uh, the signal arms. But what's shown here is intended to provide just a little bit of context about 
um, the appropriateness of putting in a signal at these two locations. Whenever you consider putting in a signal, there are what we call signal warrants in a document called the METCD, the Manual Form on Uniform, Tra Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And um, it is the, the publication that we turn to to help us decide if, uh, start the discussion if a signal is suitable at a particular location. So the METCD identifies nine warrants or nine conditions to check for to start to look at if a roundabout is appropriate. And these nine conditions look at traffic volumes, uh, pedestrian volumes, whether it's a school crossing, the investigate crash history. Um, there's a warrant for whether this is a coordinated network and it makes sense to put a signal here to help um, to complement the, the signal coordination on a network. But one thing to keep in mind is that uh, looking at signal warrants is just the first step and that a signal shouldn't be put in without an overall engineering study of its suitability. And that meeting a signal warrant in and of itself doesn't mean you need to put in a signal. There's lots of places where if we put in a signal where warrants are met, then we have you know, signals at every driveway and street along a corridor and um, it would be very frustrating to have them so close to each other. So in terms of providing context about how close are we to meeting warrants, um, we're showing some charts for the Legacy Ridge Drive intersection with uh, traffic volumes for existing conditions plus those for including the short-term growth conditions. So um, the table on the left is comparing the volumes versus those METDC D warrant 1B thresholds and highlighting in green when they exceed the threshold. And then the, the table on the right is showing the short-term growth volumes versus those thresholds. So you count the number of hours of the day where the, uh, the major street volume exceeds 900 vehicles per hour and the minor street volume exceeds 75. And if you exceed eight, then you've met that warrant. For existing conditions, six of eight hours are met. By the time we add all that short-term growth in, then, then we're meeting you know, 12 hours, which exceeds the eight required. So again, this is just to provide context as to um, you know, where we're at in terms of meeting warrants for a signal. Um, so we expect that we'd get there with this short-term short growth assumptions. So with that in mind, how do these two alternatives compare to each other in terms of roundabouts and signals? Going back to level of service, again, with all that short-term growth, if, if they remain unsignalized, they'll both be at level of service F. With a roundabout, we improve the level of service C at Henry Kramer and B, like Ridge Drive. And uh, signal performs slightly better with both performing at level of service B. Now, beyond just level of service, there are several other considerations when um, deciding whether to do a roundabout or a signal. Um, in terms of right of way or the amount of land that an intersection takes up, a roundabouts require more right of way than a traffic signal. It's a little bit bigger, they have that big circle. And so there's potentially more impacts to the surrounding land. In terms of maintenance, uh, roundabouts require less. Signals have all the electrical work and the, the bulbs and the signal heads and the mast arms that need maintenance. So there's a, there's a cost associated with that. Um, there's also a safety component. Roundabouts have fewer conflict points. So for vehicles, there are fewer opportunities to cross path with another vehicle in which you might collide. Uh, signals have more conflict points because uh, you know, vehicles are crossing paths with one another uh, much more frequently than a roundabout, which diverts you around the circle. In terms of the, the bicycle and pedestrian experience, at a signal, you're able to cross the, the legs of the intersection with uh, the illuminated hand signal, which stops all traffic movements that would cross your path and allows you to to continue forward. Whereas with roundabouts, it's a yield condition. You're crossing the individual legs of the roundabout uh, at, a, at a marked crosswalk with the island in the middle, but you are um, not guaranteed, or, or drivers are not given a red light uh, to stop for you. So the, the experience is, um, is uh, a little more risky than when you're crossing in a signal to that respect. In terms of the bicycle experience, um, through a, a signal, uh, bicyclists can ride through 
like most any intersection. The roundabout experience for cyclists is a little bit different. Um, you're, you're either riding through the circle and competing with the speeds of, uh, of vehicles, or sometimes cyclists, they get onto the sidewalk and they cross the lakes of the roundabout like pedestrians do. So it can be a little bit more difficult experience for a cyclist going through a roundabout um, than at a signal. And then there's the consistency factor. Um, there's already a signal that's going in at the high school and there's already one at the east end of Liberty Lake Road. So putting in signals would be more consistent treatment with the rest of the corridor and would um, better support a driver expectancy. So uh, based on you know, the combined input of all those factors, our, our recommendation is to preserve the consistency of the treatments on the rest of the corridor and go ahead and put in uh, signals at these intersections uh, when appropriate. We talked about the bicycle pedestrian experience. So if we think back to the, the zoning principles of the corridor and in the comprehensive plan that we want a comfortable pedestrian environment and the signals will help support um, you know, comfortable crossing movements on a country vista drive. Likewise, there are some right-of-way issues at the, the Henry Kramer intersection. There's some potential environmental concerns at the nearby land and putting in a signal will help avoid those, whereas a roundabout could start to encroach upon some of those environmental concerns. Um, and then there have been some past concerns expressed about dual lane roundabouts on the corridor. Uh, when the plans for the high school were being developed. The roundabout was one of the things considered, and there was some pushback about um, having a, a dual lane roundabout and, and uh, you know, the, the teenage drivers who would be using that to, uh, to access the high school. So that leads us to um, our next question break. I, I do see that some uh, questions have come up in the chat window. As a reminder to those of you who, who may have just joined, there's a, a chat window that you can open up using the controls on the bottom of the Zoom meeting, and you can type your questions in there. And that's when we get to these question breaks from time to time, we'll go ahead and you know, field those questions. So um, the, the first question is, how do you determine the timing for corridor improvements? That's a good question. And the answer to that is it depends on the type of improvements because uh, some improvements might be needed now. Um, other improvements are going to be uh, you know, dictated by uh, when development comes in. Uh, some improvements are going to be uh, added uh, by the landowners who develop their property and others are more um, the responsibility of the city to put in. The ones we were just talking about in terms of, of roundabouts and or, or, you know signals at intersections, um, that one is is pretty strongly dictated by traffic volumes, and so uh, as development occurs, that will advance the need for improvements to put in signals. Um, again, there are those MUTCD thresholds that help you see, you know, how close we are for a signal being an appropriate uh, treatment at this location. Um, other, other improvements we'll get to in a little bit, like crosswalks and sidewalks, um, those are more dictated on, um, you know, some might be good to put in now, and others we need to see what kind of development goes in and where it goes in to decide the time and the best place for those. I hope that answers those questions. Feel free to, to ask a follow-up question in the chat window if there's, if there's something that I missed or um, an additional question that you want answered. The next question in the chat window is, is it possible to put a roundabout instead of a stoplight north of the high school? Um, you know, feel free to, to jump in, Lisa, on this one, but my understanding was when the traffic study for the, the high school is conducted, that was one of the options they looked at, but ultimately the decision was to, um, to go ahead and put in a signal. So let me just see if, okay, Lisa's not raising her hand, so uh, she's not here to interrupt me. But I could go ahead and unmute you, Lisa, just in case, just in case there's uh, something you wanted to add to that. 
So let me see if I can get the controls. Hello. Yes. So a um, couple things. We actually did talk about that with the high school. One of the concerns in putting um, a roundabout at the high school is that it would be necessary to be a two-lane roundabout. And there was, um, there was concern about um, uh, how well uh, students who were learning how to drive might handle that situation. So um, it, was, uh, uh, it was very strongly um, uh, advised that we, that we go with, the, with a traffic signal rather than a roundabout. The other thing I will say is that um, uh, really the ship has sailed on that in that um, uh, we have been awarded a grant with the, uh, from the Transportation Improvement Board uh, for addition of the signal and the signal is already in design and will be installed in the next year or so. Thank you, Lisa, for your help with Thank that. You. Well, the next question is, what about pedestrian bridges? Awesome lead-in to the next part of the presentation. We're gonna talk about pedestrian crossings on Country Vista next. Not seeing any other questions pop up. So we'll go ahead and move on. Oh, here we go. Just in the nick of time. Capacity of traffic, roundabout right versus signal. Impact on downstream traffic. Um, if I was Alex Trebek, I'd scold you for not forming your response in the form of a question. But <laughs> I think I get what you mean. Uh, if you're asking about, hey, what are the differences in terms of capacity of a roundabout versus a signal? And what kind of impact does it have on, on downstream traffic? I'll try to answer it that way. Um, you know, which one has more capacity? Well, yeah, it depends. How many lanes do you have on the roundabout? If you have a two-lane roundabout, it certainly has more capacity. And if you have a, a signal, again, it kind of depends on the number of lanes going through the signal as well as the timing. One of the di differences about a roundabout versus a signal is when you build a roundabout, you're more or less uh, kind of stuck with what you have. The, the size of the roundabout, the number of approach lanes dictates its capacity and how efficiently it functions. With the signal, there's a little bit more flexibility to, to modify the signal timing as traffic volumes change. And so you, you can adjust things to um, provide a little bit more capacity for certain movements when you have a signal. Um, at a roundabout, the, the only real way to change things is to go back in and add more lanes to approaches, add more lanes to the circle itself. Um, you know, but generally, you know, roundabouts, when, when you build it, if you, if you keep within those volume ranges that we talked about earlier, um, then it should, it should work fine and you shouldn't really need to go in and, and change things. In terms of the impact on downstream traffic, it depends uh, if you're talking about the minor road or the, the major road of the, the intersection or roundabout. But as you can imagine, signals will, will stop flow in one direction, which can create a pretty big gap downstream. Uh, which we could be beneficial for those you know, turning on and off the roadway, provides some, some gaps for them or pedestrians crossing the roadway. Roundabouts can do the same thing. It's, it's a little more sporadic. Uh, the gaps in, in traffic are, are much more random. They're not at regular intervals like as dictated by the signal timing. So it's, it just depends on what vehicles arrive at the roundabout and when they arrive and which direction and you know, whether they're going to get into the circle where they have the right of way and stop somebody else from getting in, which could create a gap in traffic downstream. So I hope that answers your question. Again, feel free to, to put in a, a follow-up response in the chat window. The next one that popped up is what kind of traffic control is planned for East Broadway and Appleway slash Country Vista? Um, so the extent of our study may not be addressing the location that you're talking about. Um, East Broadway is not on this particular part of the corridor, um, unless I'm missing something. Well, so if, if I may, Charles, yeah, um, please. If, if you look at the very, the very western end where Country Vista turns into Apple Way, that little curve that's that's uh, just barely within the city, 
that's actually Broadway. And okay. um, at this point, yes, yeah, there you go, perfect. So, so that is that is within the city. Um, at this point, we've seen no indication of the need to even begin to look at anything at that particular corridor. Uh, traffic volumes are pretty light in the, at that cor corridor or at that intersection. Yeah, and, and the way the high school site plan is laid out, it's not going to be funneling, uh, you know, a lot of traffic onto here. Most of the, the trips to from the high school are coming to signal as well as another access where I'm indicating at the pointer here, just to the east of, of the signal there. So, so I would anticipate that I would anticipate that that would remain a stop controlled intersection until uh, there's significant development on Broadway or Appleway that um, merits additional consideration. Yeah, but yeah, that has not been a, a focus on um, this study. It's kind of outside our study area. So we, we, in this particular effort, we don't provide much data on that location. Okay, so I think we're ready to move on. Um, our next discussion topic is about uh, a recommendations for crosswalks, crosswalk types. Now, when you're looking at crosswalks on a corridor, there's two things to consider. There's where we put the crosswalk and then what kind of crosswalk. And it's important to get the right type of crosswalk uh, because conditions change as uh, the roadway um, widens or, or has a faster speed limit or the, the type of development adjacent to it changes. The faster we drive, the more narrow our cone of vision becomes. So the less ability we have to perceive pedestrians on one side of the roadway crossing into the path of, of our vehicle. But likewise, we need to take into account the expectations of a roadway. If the roadway feels wide and fast like a runway, we're, uh, as, as drivers, we are less able to perceive something that's there because we don't expect it. There's also the concept of momentum. And there's the physical momentum, but there's also just the perceived momentum, where if you're driving along a road, the high rate of speed, and somebody is crossing in a crosswalk with very little signage or any type of amenities, or somebody even looks like they want to cross, they're standing on the side of the road, um, you can, uh, drivers are less inclined to stop because there's, there's a uh, perception of I'm going really fast, if I slam on the brakes, am I going to be hit from behind? Or just that feeling of, hey, who belongs here? If the roadway feels like it's, it's uh, only for vehicles and then uh, pedestrians are hesitant to cross, drivers are hesitant to stop and let them in. You can have the reverse effect in the heavy downtown area where there's tons of people walking around or, or just getting out of an event, like a sports event or a concert, and everybody's just crossing the road in big crowds. And even though the light turns green, everybody continues to cross because there's this concept of, hey, we've got the momentum, we're dominating the road, you're gonna wait for us. You know, so with that in mind, how do we know what the right type of crosswalk treatment is for a particular location? There's some pretty good guidelines about what we need and when we move on from something that's just a painted crosswalk and start to consider other amenities to add. So there's some, some research done in some publications by the FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, that talks about how adding crosswalks alone may not make a crossing safer. And in fact, in certain locations, a marked crosswalk alone should not be used. And um, I'll highlight some of those conditions when the speed limit is greater than 40 miles an hour, or when the ADT, which again is the average daily traffic volume, exceeds 12,000 vehicles per day, and you do not have a refuge island for the crossing. Or even with a refuge island, if the, the average daily traffic increases or, or exceeds 15,000, then a marked crosswalk alone is, is insufficient. You should look for something more. Now, I like these because we, we meet or, expect, or are expected to meet these conditions uh, throughout the corridor. So we need to look um, at more amenities for, for crosswalks on the Country Vista Drive corridor. So what kind of amenities would be best and uh, provide the, the best user experience? There's, a, there's another research publication that provides pretty good guidelines. This is another NCHRP report, and it categorizes pedestrian amenities in four categories. You've got the simple crosswalk, just painted lines, 
It can have enhanced or active amenities, which include uh, advanced warning signs and flashing signs. There's a particular one that's quite popular called, called RRFBs, Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacons. There's overhead beacons. The next category is something that features a circular red signal, because a circular red, red signal is, is a command to drivers to stop. It gets much better compliance than just a flashing warning sign. So these, uh, somebody got on a bird theme and they started naming all these different types of crossing signals after birds. They've got a hawk, a toucan, a pelican. A hawk is a pretty common one that you'll see pretty frequently. It has the flashing red lights that alternate um, when it's time for pedestrians to cross. And then the last category is a, a traditional signal that's just for pedestrians. So when are either of these the right type of amenity to use? This um, research report provides some sample graphs that helps you determine the right type of treatment. And there's a lot going on in this graph, and, and I'll go through it quickly, but you find the graph that meets your condition of the road. So in this case, this is a graph for a 66 foot wide roadway. That's pretty close to what we have on the country, this drive corridor. Speeds are 35 miles an hour or less. And um, on one axis of the graph, you have the, the major road volume. So think of this as the traffic volume of country Vista Drive for the peak hour, number of vehicles per hour. And then on this axis, you have the pedestrian volume for the peak hour, how many pedestrian crossings per hour. And you find the intersection of those locations and um, you have your recommendation for what type of amenity should be used. In this case, we've plotted uh, the, the volumes on Country Vista Drive for existing and for the short term, and then just assume the pedestrian crossing volume of you know, something less than 100 pedestrians per hour. And in this case, we're clearly in the category for a red signal. So the corridor today, with its traffic volumes and the short term growth traffic volumes, we would want to put in something that has a red indicator that stops vehicles and lets patients cross. Again, the most typical one, or most commonly used one, is, is a hawk signal. Um, now, if we do something like put in a refuge island, then that changes our conditions drastically. Here's the same plot for the same type of roadway width, except if we include a pedestrian refuge island. And now let's plot those same country vista drive corridor traffic volumes and similar pedestrian volumes as before. And now our recommendation says, hey, with that refuge island, you would be thinking about adding some type of enhanced slash active treatments. Again, warning flags, uh, warning signs, uh, flashing signs, uh, flat, uh, excuse me, flashing warning signs. These are the types of categories or amenities that fit within uh, that category. So, I mean, with that in mind, we have a great example of one on the corridor already. This is the, the crosswalk between Home Depot and the Legacy Villa Apartments. It's got the meeting refuge island, and then it has these uh, RRFB flashers on each side, the, the, the rapid flashing beacons. And so this type of treatment fits that category and would be a great, in fact, our recommendation is to continue using these types of crossings um, throughout the corridor as needed. This is the type of amenity that provides, will provide the, uh, you know, the best vehicle compliance and pedestrian compliance given the conditions we have on the road. So where should they go? Well, that's um, a question uh, that should be determined as development goes in. So in general, we can provide some, some guidance for crosswalk placement. They should be spaced away from traffic signals and other crossings, and they should support the pedestrian desire lines. So as actual development patterns emerge, we'll have a better understanding of what are the complementary land uses where we would want to link them with a crosswalk on Country Vista Drive and support good pedestrian flow uh, to and from these, uh, these land uses. So again, the recommendation is uh, refuge islands with the, the RFBs, and then um, as development occurs, we'll want to put these in and, and space them appropriately so we don't have crosswalks too close to each other, but also not too far apart so that we can support good pedestrian movement through the corridor. 
Um, so that brings us to the next question break. We're kind of rounding out the last, um, the last bit of information here in this presentation. So uh, looking at the chat window, it's not appear we have any um, new questions that have been submitted. I'm going to quickly scan here, participant list, see if there's any hands raised from council members who would like to chime in. Um, again, not, not seeing any at this point. Appreciate you hanging with us. Just a few more things to go, and then we'll um, have completed the, the presentation. In terms of the, the next discussion point is the, the size of the roadway. And uh, we, we provide this for context. And again, these are preliminary results. Like I mentioned at the beginning, we're doing a, a, a long-term analysis citywide in addition to the short-term focus. And so these are the preliminary long-term forecasts that are, we're continuing to develop. But if we look at daily traffic volumes for existing versus what's expected in 2040 and compare that to a yeah, planning level threshold for the capacity of a five lane roadway. That's what we have right now on Country Vista Drive, five lane roadway. Um, you know, we see that it has plenty of capacity compared to what we have now and what's expected in the long term. So this, this five lane cross section is, should be sufficient. With a, we're well below the thresholds for starting to look at, do we need more lanes on the roadway? Um, in terms of transit, uh, we talked about STA is planning in 2021 to divert uh, their traffic, or excuse me, their, their bus route uh, from Mission onto Country Vista Drive. So, you know, where we put stops, STA wants to put stops about every half mile. So generally we should follow that, but um, with an eye towards the actual development patterns that go in and, and placing bus stops that best support and complement the land uses that go in. Additionally, we recommend that uh, the, the future development should link building interests with bus stops to make that a, a comfortable um, trip to go from a bus stop to a building entrance and vice versa. And likely, or excuse me, and likewise, future development should plan to accommodate some concrete pads to fit shelters um, that would be constructed by STA. Uh, so lastly, recommendations for uh, the bicycle and pedestrian experience. There's already some great facilities there. There's sidewalks in the entirety of the corridor. There's bike lanes on the, in the entirety of the corridor. Let's keep those. Let's move forward with the, the bike and pedestrian amenities that are planned for the, the Kramer Bridge. So that there's that, uh, that link across um, I-90. And then uh, we recommend continuing the, the back of sidewalk vegetation as per city code to preserve the, the walk friendly environment on the corridor. So uh, that will really help, um, help us achieve the goals that are established in, in zoning and the comprehensive plan. So finally, in summary, we've talked about several things. We've talked about the division for the corridor. We've talked about the conditions today. We've talked about what's coming in terms of these uh, growth from expected short-term um, development. And we've identified uh, several recommendations for the corridor. New signals at Legacy Ridge Drive and at the Henry Kramer intersection would uh, be consistent with other treatments on the corridor and would be uh, spaced well on the corridor. You don't want signals too close to each other. Um, we recommend the continuing the, the good pedestrian and bicycle amenities and having the bike and pedestrian amenities on the bridge as it's scoped to include, um, including uh, crosswalks and refuge islands with the RRFB signs on the corridor as, yeah, as future development occurs to support the complementary land uses. And then as I mentioned uh, just a second ago, continuing that vegetation along the corridor to provide a, a good experience experience for, for walking and cycling on the corridor. So um, that's the summary of the, the recommendations for, for Country Vista Drive corridor. I see that a couple of questions have popped up and so we'll take a look at those. The first one is um, what is the cost of a light traffic signal versus a roundabout? And um, 
you know, a traffic signal can cost you, you know, $250,000 is a, is a fairly good um, estimate for a traffic signal. Roundabout, I'm not as uh, well versed in the cost of constructing a roundabout. Maybe if, if I could, Charles, I can jump in. Um, so our experience has been that a roundabout uh, generally costs uh, almost double the cost of signalization. At least that's been our experience here in the city. Yeah, and, and part of the factors contributing to that are that it's, it has a bigger footprint. You have to buy some land um, around the intersection, whereas a signal, you usually don't have to buy land or as much land, and so your costs include the poles and the, the lights and the electrical wiring maybe conduit under the road to, to connect everything together. Um, keep in mind, you know, main, in terms of maintenance, the signal has maintenance costs, uh, whereas the roundabout has less maintenance costs. It's more limited to the upkeeping uh, landscaping that it might have. Um, question about what will happen to the existing S overpass or um, the pass? Is Charles, that the Charles, if I may. Um, so, so the uh, flyover, as it's commonly referred to, is actually a bypass for oversized vehicles because the uh, bridge span, uh, uh, the Barker Road bridge span, um, is substandard in terms of its height, and so um, large loads can't um, can't very often can't clear that. So unless and until funding for the full replacement of Barker Road Bridge is done by WashDOT. The flyover is WashDOT's um, uh, uh, mitigation for, the, uh, for large loads. So that's not going anywhere anytime in the near future based upon uh, what has been funded to date or what's, what, what's um, on the horizon for funding. Right. Thank you, Lisa. Um, the next question, they're picking on you, Lisa. This one's specifically for you. So, yeah. for, so is there going to be any discussion, Country Vista, north of Mission? Actually, there is. And so um, that is, uh, uh, we, have, we are doing a full-blown network analysis for the entire city. Um, and that will be in the second half of this, um, uh, uh, of the analysis um, that uh, Parametrics is going to be doing for us. Um, we fast track the country Vista corridor for really two reasons. Uh, number one, because we needed to figure out what we were going to do for the intersection of the Henry Road overpass and uh, Country Vista Boulevard or Country Vista Drive. The other thing that's uh, that's very time sensitive in this corridor has to do with the high school that's under construction, and so. We wanted to get early answers on this particular segment. The rest of the network analysis um, parametrics is already working on, and they're working on it not just for the short term, but actually for the full build out of the city. And we are expecting the results of that, uh, uh, like a preliminary in late May or early June. Is that correct, Charles? That's right, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so if you missed some of the early part of the presentation, we are doing this full network analysis for the city, short term and long term. Um, but a, with a special focus on the country is to drive corridor. Uh, next question on the list, any consideration given to underground or overhead crosswalks? Um, you know, in, in looking back at some of the uh, information I shared about you know, guidelines from research and publications. Um, I'll kind of jump ahead to here. You know, what it's showing is given the, the traffic volumes we have and the width of the road, that you can get good compliance with these enhanced active uh, amenities with the refuge island. So when you think about an overhead or underground crosswalk, there's a pretty hefty cost associated with those. So generally you wouldn't start thinking about those types of treatments unless you're up in this range, you know, in the gray area on this chart or off to the right where traffic volumes are so heavy and the pedestrian movements are so heavy that you're not going to get good compliance with these enhanced or active treatments. 
or even with the signal. You can get pretty far with, with a signal. And I would say that the experience is that um, usually a signal will work great at getting good compliance. And where people or agencies tend to move from a signal to an overhead or underground crossing is if the signal is going to start to interfere with the, the, the timing on a corridor. So generally it's, it's quite a bit of cost to put underground or overhead crossings in. And you do that when there's really a strong need for that. Um, because there's some other implications of doing that. You have to buy some of the land on either side of the road to build the ramps so that those crossings are, are ADA compliant. Uh, next question, why are guidelines used for pedestrian safety instead of the safest solution available? What is the cost of a squished team? Um, that is a question that I don't think anybody photographically looks at that in particular, but um, why are the guidelines used for pedestrian safety instead of the safest solution available? With any type of, of transportation infrastructure, there's always um, a balance between risk and cost. And of course, we never like to see any type of, of harm occurring on the transportation system. Um, but if we were able to, if we were to build everything perfectly safe, well, perfectly safe means actually we just never go anywhere and stay at home. There's always going to be an element of risk. And so what we do instead is we look at research that, that finds and points us towards the optimal solution that helps us use our uh, tax dollars wisely and, and also supports uh, the movements with, with the least amount of risk. So again, turning towards the research, the research shows that, hey, these are the types of amenities that get you the best compliance for both drivers and pedestrians, uh, given your, your particular roadway conditions, because you, you want drivers to stop as legally required when there's somebody crossing, um, but you also want pedestrians to uh, cross at the appropriate location and use the amenities appropriately. Um, you know, if you, if you overbuild, let's say for example, the street you live on might be a quiet residential street, if somebody built a traffic signal to help you cross the road, would you ever use it? Probably not, because it feels like an overkill. So we really shoot for that balance between you know, uh, reducing risk and uh, providing the best experience possible. Uh, the next comment uh, is really a comment, listen to question. Pedestrian bridge over I-90 cost around 1.5 million, part A and B in 2010. Dollars. So somebody's done a little bit of homework about uh, pedestrian bridge uh, costs. So again, that brings us towards the, the end of the, the presentation and the recommendations, recommendations that we've developed as a part of this study. Um, you know, again, thank you for your participation. It's, it's really fun and interesting to, to try different mediums of, of engagement given our, um, you know, the current conditions in society. And so uh, we appreciate that. Um, we'll see if any last minute questions pop in and we can address those, but it's, it's been a pleasure to, to engage with you and to share this information. And uh, look, look forward to further engagements as we continue this study and get into the comprehensive short-term and long-term uh, network-wide analysis. So. Charles, may I just uh, make a quick comment? Um, so uh, we have recorded today's um, virtual open house and we will be posting it both on the city website and on Facebook. Um, the, uh, the, the report is available on our website and um, we continue to invite comments and questions. Um, and uh, we'll be accepting comments for the next uh, two weeks. And then hopefully um, we will be moving on to talk more about uh, the full-blown network analysis for the city. Um, I thank everybody for your interest and your participation. Um, it's uh, really wonderful to see so many people turning out for our virtual open house. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Seeing that there's no more unanswered uh, questions, 
then uh, yeah, we will go ahead and conclude our presentation and our meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. So can you turn it back over to me so I can pause the recording? Yep, you should be the host now.